graphic for today's message up on the screen. Because today's Easter message is going to be a little bit different than a normal Easter message. You know, it's a challenge, and I'm just going to be honest with you. It is a challenge for a pastor every year to try to retell the Christmas story and the Easter story. And I've been here 18 years now. So each year it's a challenge. How do I take the same story and find some kind of truth out of this that maybe I've never covered before, never preached on before? How can I do that? Well, as I began to seek the Lord for this year's Easter message, the Lord began to remind me. He said, well, what's your theme for this year? I was like, well, GPS. Those of you that have been here for the last few weeks and months, you understand that our theme for 2019 is GPS. Growing together, partnering together, and serving together. And the Lord said, preach on serving. And the more I got into the Easter service, especially the last week of Jesus' life, which is classically called the Passion. That's, that's what church history is, is called, the Passion. The Passion of the Christ. You've probably seen the movie. And what that means, it, it is a display of the love of God demonstrated to humanity. It is the Passion. It is the love. It's the greatest love story ever told. And you know what? When we begin to look at the last week of Jesus' life from Paul Sunday to Easter Sunday, this is what we see. We see the passion of a servant's heart demonstrated throughout Jesus' ministry to everybody that was around him before he died. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. This is worth proving. Let's use this as our opening text today. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So what does that mean? That means that the same attitude Jesus had, the same spirit, the same mind, the same heart, the same focus that Jesus had, the same purpose that Jesus had should be the same reason why we do things for others while we're here on earth, right? Verse 6 says, Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And so he's telling us about his divinity. Verse 6 and verse 7 is basically telling us that before Jesus came to the earth, he was not a servant. In order for us to understand this whole message today, in order for us to understand the significance of what Jesus did between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday is to understand that before Jesus came to the earth, he wasn't a servant. He was never a servant in heaven. That's why the angels were created. Jesus' role at the right hand of the Father was not only equal with God, but he was the word of God. He was the one that spoke everything into his existence, and he's the king of kings and the lord of lords on his throne. All power and all authority. He's not a servant in heaven. That's what the angels are doing. And that's what we're going to do when we get there. Amen. Matter of fact, during the millennium, that's what we're going to do. During the millennial reign of Christ, all believers are going to serve Jesus on this earth. And we're going to labor with him. Isn't that going to be awesome? But the Bible says that when Jesus came to this planet, his purpose was to serve. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Let's look at verse 7. And it says, but made himself of no reputation, took upon the form of a what? So when Jesus came, he didn't take on the form of a king. He didn't take on the form of a, a warrior or uh, a leader of a nation or a dignitary. He didn't even take on the form of somebody that was in the temple as a priest. The Bible says that Jesus took on the form of a servant. It was made in the likeness of men. Verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Because of that, verse 9 says, because of that, wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, things that are in heaven, things that are in earth, and things that are under the earth, and, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can I get an amen? amen. Father, let your blessing be on the word. We thank you for what you've done so far. But Lord, right now... Let's take a breather. Let's hear what the Holy Spirit has to tell us today. And Father, let our heart be sensitive to you. Lord, I know you got a message for all of us. And teach us today that the whole Easter story, this whole last week of your life on this planet, was because you came to serve and you, you laid the example for us. That we too will be servants. Let your blessing be on the word, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 
We learn through the story that before Jesus took upon himself the form of man, he was king of all glory. He was never a servant. His heavenly form, in his glorified form, he was never a servant. But it was only when he came to earth and he took on flesh that God called him to be a servant. A lamb, so to speak. See, this is what qualified Jesus to become the Lamb of God, is he had to come and humble himself, as Philippians says, and he had to take on the form of a servant. When we look at the Easter story, we normally think of Palm Sunday. We think of Jesus entering Jerusalem, and we talked about that last week. We talk about the fact that Jesus comes into the temple, and he cleanses the temple. He turns over the money changers, and he says, you've taken my father's house, which is a house of prayer, and you've turned it into a den of thieves. And we see that in Easter movies. He preaches in the temple area. We see where Jesus sat with his disciples, and he had the last supper. He washed his disciples' feet. Judas betrayed him. And then we see where Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane. He was praying to the Father. And, and uh, Peter, James, and John, they fell asleep. And, and Jesus ultimately is arrested. He's beaten. And he's crucified. And then he dies. Ultimately, the Easter message is capped with the resurrection of Jesus, which is what happens on Sunday morning. And normally when we hear an Easter message, those are the topics that are covered. Not in today's message. Because I believe at the core of what Jesus did for us is the fact that he did so, according to Philippians chapter 2, with the passion of a servant's heart. And according to scripture, we are supposed to display that same heart. See, if the Easter message resonates within us, then we will look to Jesus and look to his example and say, Lord, the manner in which you sent your son to this planet. It's the same calling that you have for me. Because it's in Scripture. The book of Matthew, chapter 20, verse 28 says, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus entered this world to offer up himself for the Father's greatest purpose and mankind's greatest need. And because every human being, all of us, when we were born, we were born enslaved to sin. Jesus came to set us free. But Jesus voluntarily allowed himself to exchange his glory for flesh. And he did that because only someone wrapped in humanity could die in our place and be qualified to be the Lamb of God. Our sinless Lord had to place himself in a situation where he was subject to the world. Where he was tempted in all manner, yet without sin. That's the good news, amen. Yet without sin, hallelujah. But ultimately, the greatest service Jesus offered was his sacrifice on the cross. He allowed his purity to be violated by our transgression. In fact, God, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Jesus, who knew no sin, allowed himself to become sin for our behalf. That's why when Jesus was on the cross, and we all know the story, and he said, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? It's because at that very moment, all of the sin of all of humanity from the beginning of time until the end of time was laid on Jesus. And because the Father cannot bless sin, the Father turned away. And for the first time ever in Jesus' existence, ever, from the beginning of time, it was always the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They are eternal. They are the one that was and is and is to come. They are the Alpha and the Omega. And for the first time ever in the Son's existence, He never felt the presence of the Father. And when you're in the presence of the Father at all times, when it's no longer there, you know it. And that's when Jesus said, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus did that. For every one of you that's in here today. He exchanged his glory for your transgression. And he who knew no sin took on every sin you've ever committed to give you salvation. Hallelujah. Our sinless Savior was painfully on that cross. Feeling the burden of all guilt. The vile of all sin. The weight of every tarnished soul. And he was separated from the Father. He suffered the injustice of dying for our sins in order that God's holiness and our imperfections could be reconciled back to the Father. And this is where I'm headed today. Jesus was the Father's servant while doing this. Jesus said, I don't come to do my will, but I do the will of the one who has sent me and is going to make me a ransom for everyone's sins. 
And so when we begin to look at the Easter story a little bit more, when we begin to dissect Jesus' last week here on this planet, we understand that the same reason, the same purpose, the same manner in which Jesus was sent for us is the same mission he now gives to us. And he lets all of us know that you're not the throne on the throne of your life. You're not the master of your life. That if you want to fulfill the purpose of God for your life, you too must become a servant. This Easter, as we reflect on everything that Jesus endured on his final week on the earth, all of us have got to understand that it was accomplished because of his servant's heart. <coughs> and we've got to look at his selfless sacrifice as an example to live by. And this goes to our first lesson I want to share today. And it's this. Greatness comes through serving. I want us all to say this as we navigate through this first point. And I'll be quick. Say, I am called to be a servant. I am called to be a servant. Say that again. I am called to be a servant. Let's say that again one more time. I am called to be a servant. See, all of us have got to understand that no matter what the kingdom call is, no matter what the office calling is, no matter what the ministry calling is, no matter what the manifestation gift and calling is in your life, we're all called to be servants. It doesn't matter if I'm a bishop. And it doesn't matter that my wife's going to be a doctor. Amen. By the end of the year, she's going to be a doctor. Yvonne's a doctor. Praise the Lord. Listen, these are achievements. We should honor that. And we thank the Lord. We're not discrediting what people have achieved. We're not discrediting the offices that people hold. But this is the thing about it. At the heartbeat of everything we do. We still got to be a servant. And all of us in here got to understand that greatness comes through serving. Why? Because the world has what they call this ladder. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. In the world's eyes, what you do is you climb your way to success. We call it the ladder. It's the way that we evaluate whether we're succeeding in life or not. The, the ladder is based on position. It's based on power. It's based on money in organizations. The person who's made their way maybe to the position of the chairman of the board or the CEO or the president of the company is usually considered somebody that made it to what the top of the ladder I'm not discrediting the fact that hard work and diligence brings its rewards because the Bible tells us that. Read the book of Proverbs. You know, the Lord will, will bring honor where honor is due. And what you sow, you will reap. And, and if you have diligence and hard work, the Lord will bless you. And the Lord will give you a position. But no matter what we achieve in life, no matter where we find ourselves in life, no matter how far up the ladder we find ourselves, the heartbeat of all of us, the heartbeat of me as a pastor, the heartbeat of all of you as believers, should be, I want to follow the example of my Savior. And I need to be a servant. And I need to have the same passion Jesus had and the same passion that was displayed the last week he was on this planet to show that I do have a servant's heart. You know, it's funny, during the Last Supper, in Luke chapter 22, verses 25 through 27, here Jesus is understanding that he's getting ready to die. The whole Easter weekend story is getting ready to unfold. Jesus understands Judas is going to betray him. Jesus understands he's going to be arrested in the garden. Jesus understands that he's going to be beaten. He understands that by his stripes, and Isaiah prophesied it, that he's going to take stripes on his back, and by his stripes, we're going to be healed. Jesus understands they're going to shove a crown of thorns on his, on his head. And he understands that they're going to mock him. And they're going to spit on him. And they're going to say, come on, king of the Jews. Show your glory. Show your glory. And here Jesus is at that last supper. And what are the disciples talking about? What are they discussing? What are they talking about? They're talking about who's going to be the greatest in your kingdom when all this is wrapped up. Proving to us that even on the weekend of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, the disciples weren't concerned about anything else other than, hey, Jesus, who's going to be the top dog of the disciples? Let's look at this. Luke chapter 22, um, verse 24. Let's go back to verse 24. And uh, it says that there was a dispute among the disciples as to which of them would be considered the greatest. <laughs> Isn't this awesome? Verse 25, the king of the Gentiles exercised lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, 
He who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs those who serves. For who is greater in the world's viewpoint, he who sits at the table or he who serves? It is not the one that sits at the table, yet I among you as the one who serves. See, this concept of service and this this concept of greatness, it isn't new. It doesn't just happen in today's church society, in today's church world. It happened there on the Last Supper, even amongst Jesus' own disciples. It was a perspective that went against the grain. Because all of us are wired to think about, what am I going to get out of this? Are you listening to me? If, if I do this, what's going to be my reward? If, if I choose to take on this position, will I get any recognition for it? You know, today, I mean, we joke about it, you know, it's like everybody gets a participa- participation trophy. And we're all worried about what's going to be my reward. What am I going to get out of this? Jesus teaches them on that Last Supper. He says, that can't be your heartbeat. The reason why you do what you do, from our workers in the nursery, and preschool, to children's church, to those on the stage seen by people, even to those that are on pastoral staff or even the senior pastor like myself, my heartbeat has to be I do what I do because Jesus' example that was set before he died was he came to serve and what I do, even though I might have a position with a name and it might have honor and the Bible talks about it. The reason why I do what I do has to be because I have a servant's heart to do it. I tell you something I've noticed through the years in ministry is what you see here, it's just a couple of hours on a Sunday. What you see on a Wednesday is an hour. Real ministry is during the week when nobody else is around. Real ministry is when you get your elbows dirty and your knees dirty and your hands dirty. Real ministry is when you got some blood and sweat and tear and I've had all of them flow down my brow. I've had all of that seep into the carpet or the classrooms of this church. My blood, my sweat, my tears. But I realize that the greatest honor in life is to be a servant of Jesus (laughs) because he laid the example for me. Are y'all getting this today? The person who's usually heavily envied by the masses tends to be the person who has the most power, the most appeal, the person who has the most likes on Instagram, the person who has the most fans on their Instagram or Facebook page, the person who gets the most retweets on their Twitter account. But Jesus said, you know what? That's not greatness. Jesus said, greatness comes by serving. Let me quote to you some scriptures. I did not give this to you, Ashley, because I'm, I'm going to go through these so quick. It's not going to go on the screen, so you can write these down. And for time's sake, I'm going to breeze through this. But you realize that the disciples will get past the Last Supper. Let's just say they finally got the message. When Jesus was raised and Jesus made himself known all those days, and the Bible says when they received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, everything changed. Their approach changed. Their attitude changed. Their heart changed. And then when you go through Scripture and you read the books of the Bible that many of these disciples wrote, this is how they labeled themselves. They weren't like they were in Luke, wondering who was going to be the greatest. This is what it says. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Simon Peter, he referred to himself as a bond servant of Jesus Christ. James chapter 1, verse 1, it says, James, a bond servant of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 1, it says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, John, and you can see these in most of the books of the Bible in the New Testament where it was written by someone other than the four Gospels or other than the Apostle Paul in his letters. When you look at these other letters, Revelation was written by John the Beloved, and it says John wrote this, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which he gave him to show his servants those things that must shortly take place. I did a study on this, and, and I talked about this a while back, but I, I, for just for example, say I really believe that this is fitting for today's message. When you look up the word bond servant in Scripture, in the Greek, this is what it means. It means lower rowers. Do you know what that means? When you study Scripture and you look at how they transported things on boats, on the lower level of the boat were those who rowed the boat. 
They were the lowest of all servants. They were the ones that had the oars. How many of you ever seen movies where you've got the guys down, you know, and usually they're chained up. Usually they're slaves. They're servants and they're down in the bottom of the boat in the road. They're doing all the tough work while the captain and the crew and everybody else on the service of the boat, they're enjoying the labor of those underneath. And the Bible says that the apostles, when they understood the message of Jesus and they understood what the Holy Spirit was wanting to do through them, began to call themselves lower rowers. They understood that it was not humiliating to refer to themselves as bond servants of Jesus. Are y'all getting this? These lower rower, rowers do the exhausting, the difficult, and the unseen work of rowing these vessels across the seas. There is nothing glamorous about being a lower rower. There's nothing about this image that brings admiration from people. Matter of fact, when we get involved in ministry or we want to do something in the church, we usually don't think of that example as something that motivates us to want to do something. This last week, and I apologize if anybody saw me taking pictures during the service. They think nothing of it. I don't get a chance to do that. And I, I want to I do that. I love our Easter service. And, but this is what I did. I went around the church before service. I was taking pictures of our parking lot attendants. And I was taking pictures of our ushers and our greeters and our children's workers and, and people in the church that are doing work. And I'll tell you why I'm doing that. Because last week, when we began this Easter week and, and we had our Easter egg hunt, I showed up at Voorhees Park and I saw all the workers that was there and it hit me that day. And I thought, we can't do what we do without our workers. I had nothing to do with the Easter egg hunt. I just showed up. I was the pastor that just showed up and smiled. And, and I mean, I had a great time. I love the kids, so don't get me wrong. But I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to pack any eggs. I didn't have to put any prize baskets together. I didn't have to go out and rope off the areas for the kids. I didn't have to throw the eggs out there. I didn't have to give the prizes when the kids brought the eggs. I didn't have to I didn't have to set up. I didn't have to tear down. But it was our workers. And one of the things I'm learning as a pastor, the longer I'm in ministry, maybe finally after 25 years of pastoring, I'm getting it. I'm realizing that we can't do a thing in this church without our workers, without our servants. I might be the face of the church. I might be the one in the bulletin with my picture on it that says Bishop Dennis, and I might be the one in charge of the Facebook page. I might be the one on our YouTube videos that preaches the sermons. But I'll tell you what, there's nothing that gets done in this church without our workers. Nothing. And the hours of work that our workers put into making sure that you can show up to church and for two hours, make sure that the grounds are taken care of, make sure that the classes have a, have a teacher, make sure that the nursery has a worker and preschool has a worker and the children's church has a worker, to make sure somebody's at the door to open that door and to greet you, to make sure that there's an usher there to take care of you in case there's anything that happens, to make sure that we have a transportation team in place to go pick up anybody that needs a ride, to make sure we have a security team in place, to make sure that you're all safe in here because of the day and age we live in. We need that. And not only are they there to protect us, but they're there for any need that arises. And then during the course of the week, then we've got our office health and all the things that go on behind the scenes with Pastor Angie and with Andrea, with our computer system and all of our book. That takes a lot of work. And not just that, but then our worship team and the time they put in to singing their song. Do you know how many hours that our choir worked on today's worship set just to bring you two songs? And we sit and we breeze through it and we sit on the worship and we enjoy the talent, but we don't engage in worship and we don't realize it took them hours, hours, weeks really to put that lineup together. Weeks for Loren to seek the Lord and to find out, God, what do you want me to sing on that Easter Sunday? I want to be a servant. I know I'm doing this for you. I'm not doing this for recognition. But it comes with an understanding as we grow together and partner together and serve together. This whole theme of GPS, it allows us to understand the only way we do anything here is is our workers, our servants who do it for the king. Am I getting this? So yes, or last week I saw the Easter egg hunt and then this week all the hours that went into the resurrection breakfast. Guys, didn't we have a great resurrection breakfast? I mean, we had a great resurrection breakfast. Did you enjoy the food? It's awesome food, wasn't it? 
Some of you are like, there was bacon. Of course it was awesome, man. It was awesome. <laughs> it was awesome. You know what I did? You know what I did? I mean, I, I helped set the tables up on, on Thursday, and, and I kind of overseen everything. And, and I did some of the, you know, the graphics and all that stuff. But the, the, the majority of the work, the table settings, the decorations, the food that was cooked. Many of our ladies cooked that food at home and brought it. And all the work that was done yesterday, it was our workers that did that. And then I come in today and I see all of our workers here showing up early. We got intercessors that were here at 7 o'clock. I mean, we had a team of intercessors going up and down these rows and praying over every seat and praying over our classrooms. Here serving in a capacity that you don't even know about. And I sit back and I think, thank you, Lord, for our servants. How many of you thank the Lord for our workers and our servants of the kingdom? And so what that tells me is that we're all called to be a servant, all of us. And that leads to lesson two. Let's look at a simple definition of servanthood. In John chapter 12, verse 25, Jesus says, He who loves his life will lose it. But he who hates, now I'll, I'll touch on that just for a second. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Well, what, what did Jesus mean? That I can't love myself? Jesus is saying that I got to hate anything to do with this life and I can't enjoy life. I can't enjoy my family. I can't enjoy the blessings. That, no, 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 no. When you look up the word hate and you look up, it's, 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 it's real meaning in the Greek. It means love less than. What it means is a, it's a heart. It's a heart condition. It is a motive that says when it comes to this life, Doing the call for the kingdom, doing what God wants me to do as a servant, I love that more than I do anything else, and my motives are pure. What it means is I'm not doing what I'm doing because I'm self-centered. I'm not doing it for attention. I'm not doing it because I'm selfish or I'm greedy, and I'm really not doing it for my own benefit. What that means is I'm doing it to serve. The person who hates his life is the person who's willing to put others first. The one who gives and helps others. This is the person who is the servant. And, and I get it. Some people confuse hating one's life by having low self-esteem or diminishing your gifting or diminishing the fact that God loves you and you're special and you're created in his image. That's a lie from Satan. Don't believe that. That's what it really means. We do have value, but the heartbeat of all we do should be this. God, I want to be your treasure I want to give you honor. I want to give you glory. And the only way I can do it is the way Jesus did before he died. And that is I want to do everything I do with a servant's heart. This is the quality of life that Jesus lived. Jesus understood that in order to be first, we've got to be last. That in order to be great, we've got to be a servant. Luke chapter 12, verse 48 says, For everyone to whom much is given, much is going to be required, and to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask more. Scriptures also tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, it says, For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, yet not using their liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. You know what he's really saying right there? Is the world is watching. The world is listening. And they want to make sure that what you are doing for the kingdom is done with the right motives. How many of you know that the world's watching and the world is listening? How many of you know that the world, especially in today's day and age, needs to see transparency and genuineness? That's the only way you're going to win people to Jesus. That's the only way you're going to have people want to know the God that you're serving is they want to see that you have a servant's heart. They want to know that you're humble. They want to know that you're not doing what you're doing for selfish recognition or because you want to get ahead in life. Let God deal with that. God will bless you. Listen, listen, God will give you honor. God will give you promotion. He'll do it. Just like with Joseph, Joseph served Potiphar. Joseph served in the prison. And in one day after 13 years of serving, he went from the prison to the palace because God had a high calling on his life, but he had a servant's heart along the way in order to get to where God wanted him to be. 
And the lesson that God is trying to teach the Terre Haute Church of God is that as we navigate together through the future, as we come together, we got to grow together, partner together, and we got to serve together. That the atmosphere of the Terre Haute Church of God, this is what God wants, genuineness, transparency, reality, that when people come off those streets and they walk through those doors, they don't see somebody that's doing what they're doing because they want to be seen of man. They're doing it because they genuinely love people. When it's your turn to work the nursery, when they're leaving in the foyer, they don't want to hear you complaining in the foyer that you had to change a dirty diaper that day. They don't want to hear you complaining that it was your turn to work security. They don't want to hear you complaining that you had to do something or you had to work children's church or you had to serve. That way. The world don't want to hear that. And that's not what's going to win the world. And they definitely don't want to hear it during the week. And they definitely don't want to see you posted on social media. They want to see genuine. And this leads to lesson three, and I'll close with these points. Let's talk about some trademarks of a servant's heart. You ready? I want you to write these down. Let's put these up here. Let's put that next slide up there, Ashley. Thank you. Number one, a true servant does not demand recognition. Let, let me say this. Jesus was given all of the glory of heaven. All of the angels rejoiced. The whole earth bows down at the feet of Jesus. Well, because when Jesus came, he didn't demand recognition. He didn't want to sit on the throne. He didn't want to be equal with Caesar. He didn't want to come and overtake the Roman government like Peter thought he was going to. Jesus came. He didn't demand any of those things. He served. So the first thing we realize is we cannot demand recognition. Let, listen, let recognition seek you down and find you out. Now, I'm not minimizing the fact that we should. I believe we ought to show honor where honor is due. I believe that. And throughout the course of the year, we try. We fail. We fail because we're human. But we try the best we can. I know that I try. I know our leadership tries. I know Pastor Adam does. I know our other leaders. We try to say thank you and God bless you and, and, and show recognition and, and try to bless people throughout the year and provide staff meals and Christmas gifts and cards and gift cards and other things. We try to do those things. We fail sometimes, but we try to do that. It's when we demand it that we need to do a heart check. The second thing we understand is a true servant does not demand a return on their giving or others. Oh boy, Jesus. A servant gives without expecting anything in return from the person that he or she has served. The reason why is because if that's our heartbeat, then we're struggling with manipulation in control. You know, through the years I've seen a lot as a pastor. I've had people in my office, I've had people look at me wanting and demanding something, wanting, demanding something to be done. And it's usually not a heaven or hell issue. It's usually a decision in the church that needs to be made. I've actually had people, nobody attends here right now, but I've actually had people look at me and say, you know, I give a pretty good tithe, pastor. I just want you to know that. Well, that's good. That's good. And, and why did you feel it necessary to let me know that? Well, Pastor, we've been here a long time, you know. That's, that's nice. But see, a true servant doesn't demand a return. A true, a, a true servant doesn't say... Do you see the zeros on that check? In return for that. Who was it that told me a couple of weeks ago? They said, Pastor, the first service I attended there, I remember you saying, a million has six zeros. Who was it that said that? Who was it that said that? I was, now I was saying that during the offering. I was like, everybody's got a million. We'll take it, man, because I'd love to buy this block for the kingdom. You know? Amen. We don't demand a return. You let God take care of it. Am I making any sense in here today? I, I, I know this is not the typical Easter message. But really it is, isn't it? When you see Jesus beaten, he's a servant. When you see him taking those stripes, he's a servant. When you see that crown of thorns on his head, he's a servant. When you see him carrying the cross down Gol up to Golgotha and down the streets of Jerusalem, he's a servant. When you see him on the cross taking those nails, he's a servant. When you see him saying, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, he's a servant. When you see him say, Lord, Lord, why have you forsaken me? He's a servant, amen. 
When you see the images of Jesus taken down from the cross and his mother is there and she's wrapping him in those grave clothes and they're getting ready to take him in a borrowed tomb, you see a servant. All the blood, all the gore, all the violence, it's a servant's heart. And Jesus set the example and he lets us know serving doesn't always come with a crown of gold. You'll get that. You'll get it. But it comes because you just want to do my will. And here's the, the last one. We'll end off this one. A true servant does not insist on always getting their way. What does that mean? It means we have a compliant spirit, a yielded spirit, a servant's heart, submitted. Anybody here, when you got saved, ever struggle with your will and God's will? Some of you are like, what do you mean when I first got saved? I've been saved 30 years. I'm still dealing with my will and God's will. <laughs> Amen. But when you have a servant's heart, it's yielded. And it says, what I have isn't mine. It's only mine because you gave it to me, Lord. I'm yielded. My time's yours. My talent's yours. My treasure's yours. Amen. It's all for your glory. And it's all for your kingdom. We don't insist on having our way. We have a yielded spirit. And we yield the right of way. Romans 12.10, Paul says, giving preference to one another. And let me close with this. And the musicians can come up. In Ephesians 5.20 20 and 21, it says, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So you can look around the church. Musicians, come on up. You can look around the church and you can say, well, what kind of relationship am I supposed to have with the people that I worship with? This is what you need to tell yourself. Yes, you are your brother's keeper. You are. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, love does not behave rudely and it doesn't seek its own. Romans 12, 10 says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 39, Jesus says, you love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, but the second is connected to it. You love your neighbor as yourself. So today, as we close this message and we think about the Easter story. I want you to go back and I want you to think about the last day, few days of Jesus' life. I want you to think about that last week. I want you to think about the passion. What I want you to understand in the center of it all, everything Jesus did for you. It's because he had a servant's heart. And it was his servant's heart that was his gateway to the throne. Stand with me.